Thank you, Taylor, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm Brendan Hall. I'm a content producer here at Huddle. I'll be, for next half hour, uh, Kenny and I are going to have a wonderful chat here about all things branding, the future of Howard basketball, the recruiting and creativity, uh, and encompassing all of that. Um, we'll get into it in a second, but Kenny, I want to give you the floor and just say hello to everybody here. Kenny, how's it going? What's up, B? How you doing? My name is Kenny Blakeney. I'm the head coach at Howard University. Uh, this is an awesome opportunity to talk about our program, the branding of our program, and the branding of our university. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, Howard has had a lot of buzz uh, over the last year. I think a lot of people are excited about what this thing could become. Um, and, and branding is an important part of that, especially for, for a program like you guys. And uh, I, I'll start with this. Um, what is your philosophy with, with, with branding uh, from, from, from a high level there? Yeah, I think you got to start with uh, going back maybe about, you know, 14 years ago. Um, I was an assistant coach at Harvard from 2007 through 2011. And being there at the most prestigious, you know, academic institution and one of the largest brands in the world uh, with Coach Tommy Amaker really taught me a lot about branding. He utilized that brand to develop a basketball program that was considered at the time a division three basketball program uh, into one of, I think, the top 50 programs and jobs in the country. And it was neat to see him take that and evolve it from, you know, guys that were not really serious about basketball, but serious about their academics to guys that were serious about basketball and very serious about their academics. Uh, I think Coach Amaker was probably one of the first people that kind of introduced the idea of branding and basketball to me. Uh, fast forward four years, I was at a crossroads in my career and I started a company called Sport and Styles. It took off as a fashion company, but in reality, it was a marketing and branding company. Um, and so I did that from 2012 until 2016 2018, excuse me, full time, uh, where we work with companies like the NBA, Major League Soccer, the NHL, Hockey Fights Cancer, uh, NASCAR, the Dave Matthews Band. And it was just a great opportunity to kind of understand and take a deeper dive into branding and marketing. Fast forward, I did a project uh, over four years with Under Armour in their global marketing and branding uh, division of basketball. And that was great because I got to sit at the table with so many smart and I think creative people that really, you know, took my level of understanding what branding was and what marketing is to another level. Uh, and, and being around the game a little bit, it, it got me kind of whetted my appetite a little bit to want to get back into coaching. And I thought with all of the experience that I had, um, being at those tables, having those conversations with people in the NBA, NHL, Major League Soccer, UA, whatever those global entities were, really would prepare me for getting back into college. So I volunteered at Columbia University where I was living in New York City uh, and went there and, and just felt that those lessons learned, it was almost like a graduate program for me, being in those different classrooms. Uh, I just felt like I could take the brand Columbia and utilize it in a way to really help coach Jim Ingles uh, during that year I was there and in taking that program to the next level. Uh, fast forward, I got the call from Howard and I was totally intimidated and scared. I, uh, because I knew growing up in Washington, DC, what that brand meant. And uh, if I answered that call, I knew it was gonna be a, a lifestyle change, not only for myself, but for my family. Uh, we were very comfortable in New York and uh, really felt at home there. Uh, but I knew Howard could be a special basketball program as it is a special university. So understanding that brand um, of Howard, I, I, you know, you have so many wonderful alums. You have Thurgood Marshall, you have Felicia Richard, you have Chadwick Bozeman. I mean, you can go down the list of alums that have accomplished so much on that campus. And after they're, they've graduated, I thought you could utilize that success 
and translate it to the basketball court. And, you know, it's a brand that really resonates with so many people. And it's not only regionally or locally here in the DMV, it's globally. Um, you have parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Uh, somebody knows someone that has gone to Howard University. So understanding that um, there was certain touch points that I felt that we could take to really get that basketball brand of Howard basketball out to people, not only local or regional recruits, but guys that are five-star recruits. Um, so we were started with uh, a young man, Josh Christopher, and he's a uh, top 15 recruit at the time in high school out of the LA area. Um, his family was very familiar with, the high, with, with, with Howard University. It was a place that they wanted to see. It was a place that they were very excited to hear from. And they understood the power of the brand. When Josh, I think, committed to taking a visit to Howard, his tweets and his Instagram posts might have doubled uh, from the popularity of him, but also pairing that with Howard University. What a unique kind of fit and feel that that was. A, a young man that could go to any place in the country taking a look at Howard. So, you know, it became not only a sports story, it became almost like a human interest in a news story. Um, and Josh had a wonderful visit. He ended up going to Arizona State, drafted this year by the Houston Rockets. And I think he felt such a connection to the university. Uh, I just spoke to his dad last week. His dad, just get, his dad gives me a call maybe once or twice a month just to check in. And he really feels still a part of uh, Howard and wants to, you know, know what we're doing. And then if there's anything that they can do out in the L.A. area or now in Houston, uh, you know, they're, they're all, all in on that. Um, our second young man that we recruited, a five-star gentleman, McCore Maker. Uh, McCore was a top 15 player out of California as well, um, originally from South Sudan. And we just positioned a marketing strategy around him that was about 125 pages. Um, which was really me. 125? 125 pages. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so in, in laying this out, we, we took him step by step of how we could position, separate, market his brand in a way that no other university that was recruiting them could do. Boy. His brand went from maybe... 35,000 on Instagram to overnight, probably to about 95,000 people when he committed to us. He heard from people like, you know, Grant Hill, King James, Spike Lee, the vice president of the United States reached out. Um, it was so unique of having a, a gentleman that was a five-star, you know, recruit commit and, you know, enroll in a HBCU and then Howard University at that, um, it became a story that was, you know, bigger than lives. It, it was a story that, you know, we talked about it in the presentation that it's not going to only be on ESPN or Bleacher Report or, you know, whatever those sports kind of outlets are. This is going to be on Wall Street Journal. It's going to be in People Magazine. It's going to be on the Today Show, it's gonna be on CNN. You know, it becomes a story now that is a bigger, larger human interest news story than just a sports story. And to both of these guys' credit, they got it and they understood it. That's incredible. By the way, I think, uh, I mean, imagine that, like you're committing to a college and you get a, a message from the vice president of the United States. Hey, welcome to Howard. I mean, that's, that's gonna make you feel like a million bucks, doesn't it? Well, no, no doubt about it. And, and, and we talk about Howard being the Mecca, right? Right. It's, it's one of those places where any and everything can be accomplished. Um, you know, you look at Dr. Charles Drew, you look at, you know, like I said, Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, Elijah Cummings, what, you know, the wonderful work that he did uh, for the, you know, the great state of Maryland. Um, you can go down the list of people that have done so much here. And we talk about how you know, being at Howard University, 
it's a place that you can become a global citizen. We have 175 embassies here. We're right down the street from the White House and the Capitol. So it takes a special and unique person. And I talk about, you know, with our recruiting uh, presentation, you got to have shoulders big enough to really understand and to make this commitment to our university. I can play for you. This is getting me fired up. No, <laughs> um, Kenny, I, I do want to talk on about this too, uh, changing gears a little bit. Um, when we first talked yesterday, uh, you mentioned about uh, Jeremy Darlow. Uh, we're both fans of, of his books. I think for anyone watching today who wants to get into sports marketing, I think there's two uh, Jeremy Darlow books that are essential reading, uh, Brands Win Championships, and uh, actually pulled this out, right? Uh, the Darlow Rules, uh, which I, I know you've read. Uh, but you made a salient point that uh, he alludes to in, in, in this book. I think this is Darlow Rule 9, actually. What, what we see is what you get. And, that, and, and, it, and it was relation to Dennis Rodman, right? Um, universally regarded as one of the greatest rebounders ever in the game, right? But not even top 20 uh, in the all-time rebounding list in the NBA. Um, so I, I, you know, he, he says, what we see is what you get. And, and the, the idea is, is uh, the repetition of an idea from a variety of touch points and the importance of that. Uh, I, I guess this is all a good segue for me to, to lead you into talking about just the value of perception. Uh, and I think you laid out some of it already here, but I want to just dive a little bit more into that. Yeah. Well, you, you know, we talked about Rodman and how he's considered one of the greatest rebounders ever in which he is right. He dominated games with his defensive prowess and his rebounding uh, energy and, 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 and what he did there. But you look at him statistically He's not even one of the top 20 greatest rebounders in the history of the game, but he dated Madonna. Global story, right? It, it transcended sports. It got over into pop culture and people equated his talent, which was rebounding to him being like this monster, great Wilt Chamberlain kind of rebounder. His time in Vegas, you know, uh, being in the last dance, his opportunities that he spent in WWE, his tattoos, his piercing, his hair. So he was really changing the game in terms of the branding angle at a time when, you know, we weren't really talking about branding like this. Uh, we, we knew what it was. We talked about marketing, but his, 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 him branding himself in a way where, you know, again, it was a news story. It just wasn't a basketball story. Every step this guy took, people wanted to know what he was doing. But they also, you know, talked about him being such a great and, and, and incredible rebounder, uh, which made, I think, the myth of Rodman as the best rebounder ever a lot bigger. So, yeah, perception is reality. And it's like what you put out there is what, what people are going to see. Um, and that goes to, like we said, the number nine rule in Darla's book. And Rodman, I think, encompassed that a whole lot. And we try to take this brand and utilize it in that way. Um, you know, we're considered a program that's probably a mid to low major program, right? But in the last two years, we wanted to take this brand and put it front and center and in front of everybody's face where people aren't thinking about like, they're a mid major, they're a low major, like, People look at us and the pressure's on, like we're, you know, one of those universities that should be considered a top 50 university athletically basketball wise year in and year out. Like I, I have, you know, with last year, the questions that I was receiving with McCore Maker, I was like, you know, we won four games my first year. And it's not like we're going to we're going to grow the program to be, you know, a final four program overnight. There are steps to this thing. And, you know, we have to take the right steps. But what we've done is, I think, perception wise, we've done, a, I think, a really good job of elevating our brand and positioning in a way that, you know, people assume that our program is a lot further down the road than probably what it is. By the way, for any of the pro wrestling fans here, I think we need to make a small correction. Uh, it was WCW, I think, that Dennis Rodman was in. He, 
as a as a as a as a teenage boy uh, in in Massachusetts, that was a where were you moment when Robin joined the NWO. Okay, with uh, Hulk Hogan. So. <laughs> was it given the Wolfpack signs? It was, it was given. Uh, well, well, that was a red NWO, I think. But yeah, I don't know. It, it got muddled somewhere in the nineties. But yeah, no, it was it was a where were you moment for sure, for sure. Um, I I, I want to go to this. Uh, we we we've we've. Uh, you know, off, off camera, we had so many great conversations about creativity here. I, I want to bring this to the forefront. Everybody has their own idea of creativity, what it is, what it entails. Um, I, I want to know what's your uh, approach to creativity? What, what does creativity mean to you? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. And uh, I, I think it's one of those things that we're growing up, we didn't have a whole lot, you know, financially. Um, but I always aesthetically liked nice things. Uh, I always appreciated beautiful art or, you know, beautiful clothes, whatever that is, flowers, plants. Um, so I always had to kind of figure something out, uh, you know, with, with limited means. So if, if I was going to have art in my room, um, it wasn't like I can go somewhere and buy a, you know, thousand dollar piece of art. Uh, that wasn't happening. So I had to create it. Um, and not having talent, how, how do I figure this out? So it, it, it just made me be a little bit more creative, I think, in terms of uh, aesthetically understanding what and how to do things in a way with minimal money. Uh, you know, if I wanted to, if I had shell top shoes, right, all the Adidas that we, you know, all wore growing up, uh, if I had on a green shirt that day, well, I was changing the color of my stripes to green. <laughs> if I had on red, I was changing my stripes to red. Uh, it, just different things, I think, be that allowed me to start to tap into a creative side a little bit. Uh, you know, when you don't have those kind of means, it just it, it made me a little bit more creative, I think. It made me a little bit more resourceful. Uh, to, to really try to grow and learn more and, and aesthetically do things around my environment or around me uh, to, you know, that, that was more, more pleasing to the eye. I, I was going to save this art question until the end, but since you brought it up, uh, I want to bring it to the forefront. First, can, can we see th this, this awesome piece of artwork behind you? Uh, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, yeah. You said it was called 4-3? So this piece is called 4-3. It was done by one of our friends. Her name is Ellen Kenny, and she is the president of a fashion company called ALC. Um, it's a big time company and she is a big time artist. She started, she studied art at the University of Georgia and uh, has done a lot of pieces. And, uh, you know, this piece right here, it's a, it's a little bit of a, I call it a rustic chic piece, uh, but it fits in our home really well. Uh, against the white brick walls and kind of pops a little bit. But, you know, doing the, doing our, our starting our company called Sporting Styles, um, you know, we made, it was kind of neat because when we started off, we started off with hockey, right? And really, I, I was the only African American and maybe even the only, uh, you know, US scarf maker in the country at this point in time. So, we developed a scarf per each team. So every team had their own individual scarf. So basically we had to come up with 30 different scarves for every team in the league. Um, instead of making one cookie cutter scarf and just changing the colors and the logos, we did like, you know, the Capitals had one scarf that was so different. And then the Bruins had another scarf that was so different than, you know, Toronto Maple Leafs had a scarf that was different than the Canadian. So it was, it was one of those things that, and, you know, over the course of, you know, you do that with scarves, you do that with socks, you do that with ponchos, you do that with ties, you do that with, you know, two or three different kind of ties, bow ties, skinny ties, traditional ties. You start to add up the skews, you know, you have over a thousand different skews uh, and in and, 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 and different uh, designs per year. Um, so th that created that, that creative gene or that creative thing that, you know, our, our team had to have um, was real to kind of keep things fresh, to keep, you know, on trend, 
to understand different, you know, understand what Louis Vuitton was doing, understand what Dior was doing, understand what Gucci was doing, uh, understand what, you know, things were being done in PacSun, understand what Nike and Under Armour was doing. We were kind of following trends, uh, not only in the athletic world, but also in the, you know, in luxury fashion world as well. So can you draw parallels between the artistic process and your approach to coaching? How, how does this influence you as a coach? That, that's a great question. Um, and, and my mind works. It, it's so I've done some interior design uh, and it's, it's uh, I was very fortunate and lucky. We had a, we had a house that was located in Atlantic beach. And uh, that is the Nassau County right outside of Queens uh, in New York. And uh, it was, it was a house that uh, HGTV selected to be on one of their different shows. And we gutted out the whole house when we got it. And when we were kind of putting it back together, the one thing that I felt really good about is that I understood spacing, right? Playing in motion basketball my whole life, uh, you got to understand spacing. And so when you're putting, you know, art up on the walls or you're putting the couch here and you're putting you know the tv and lamps or bookshelves for me it, it's all spacing and so I, I think understanding you know spacing in athletics spacing in basketball has really helped in the creative process of you know well let's put this logo here and move it up two inches to create more space from you know maybe the stripes that you're going to put here um, I, I look at, you know, interior design and also either graphics or, or artwork uh, all within spacing. I, I want to switch gears to, uh, this is such an important part of your program, but, but all the social justice. And you mentioned Thurgood Marshall at the beginning of this talk. Um, I, I think to understand Howard's importance, its place in the lexicon of American progress, you can start right there with Thurgood Marshall arguing before the Supreme Court with one of the most landmark cases in American history, Brown yeah. versus Board of Education. Yeah. Um, what, what role does social justice play in your program and what do you want your players to be? Yeah, that, that's such a great question and, and thank you. Um, over the last two years, our country has seen, you know, a change uh, some has been good and some hasn't been good. Our program has tried to participate in every step of the good and the bad. Um, being at Howard University, I think it's our responsibility as educators, which I know I see myself as even more so before a coach, to have our young men participate in peaceful protests, participate in voter registration, participate in community service. Um, I read a quote every day before practice. You know, again, I, I see our classroom as a, as a, you know, our, our court, our basketball court is our classroom. And, you know, if we utilize it in the right way, it, it's, a, it's a classroom that I think you can get more done in it maybe than some other classrooms on, on, on university campuses and in high schools and junior highs and elementaries. Um, but it, it's, it's first and foremost, you have to view it as a teaching educational place. And, and that's where we utilize it. So over the last two years, we've had over 30 speakers speak to our team. And they've talked about everything from Joe's social justice to George Floyd, to, you know, the impact on the election, to voter registration, um, you know, a part of what's, what's going on right now as well in sports is mental health. Um, so we've had an opportunity to kind of touch upon all of those different topics. Um, and then our players have had an opportunity to kind of communicate with some of the most well thought out, you know, leaders uh, in their fields in the country and either talk about those, debate them, uh, or just have a greater understanding 
from somebody that has, you know, so much more experience in those different lanes and channels. So, you know, we did a voter registration program, uh, which was great. We teamed up with When We All Vote um, and was able to partner with Notre Dame on that to register as many people as we could to vote uh, during the last national, last national election. Uh, we raised money for students and teachers and people uh, in the Howard community that got displaced because of COVID and their families. So we had a month long virtual fundraiser where we you know, were, was able to do different things. We worked with uh, a campus uh, designer that does wonderful work uh, at Heritage Legacy and Pride. Um, we did a collaboration with him on some shorts and shirt combinations that that money went to, you know, the different organizations. We had a couple of local DJs. Uh, our, our campus is, is famous for having, you know, these DJs and producers and people in the entertainment uh, lane. Uh, and we were lucky to have a couple of those people join us to do, you know, some virtual parties where we we're able to raise some money. Um, so we, we, we were able to do that. And like I said, we had the speaker series, which lasted, we'd have one to two speakers a week, uh, which was unbelievable. So it's very important to have that aspect of social justice, um, to communicate it, to talk about it. Um, you know, we're right down the street from the White House, we're right down the street from the Supreme Court, we're right down the street from the Capitol, we're right down the street from the African American Museum. If we're not utilizing these things and in, in teaching our students about, uh, to help them gain I think maturity in their academic experience and their, their, their educational experience at Howard, then we're not doing our job as mentors. Can we talk a little bit more about, uh, you, you had mentioned this yesterday about McCor Maker and his work with Awareness for South Sudan. Um, and can we, can we talk a little bit more about that? Because that was really interesting. Yeah, you know, McCor was a gentleman that when he, when we were recruiting him, had such an interest for reusable energy. Uh, in particular, you know, solar energy, uh, water, um, all the different resources that we take for granted as a, you know, a country that has, you know, d disposable uh, resources. And, you know, in, in talking to McCor, we, we talked about him being a global citizen and having an opportunity to, you know, work with Capitol Hill and to present um, to Capitol Hill you know, about South Sudan and, and the wonderful country which it is, but with their, with their resources, some of those things are limited. So he was gonna bring awareness to, you know, I think some of the issues that, that plague his, his country of South Sudan, uh, but because of COVID, we weren't able to really um, bring all that stuff together. But, you know, it, 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 we love our players to do that. Um, we're working right now on having a couple of our guys on Capitol Hill um, we'd love to get somebody in the White House for internships. We, we've started to work on internships already with our guys. And, you know, that's something being at Howard, being here in Washington, D.C., having a network of, you know, relationships from Harvard and Columbia, you know, or our Duke relationships as a Duke guy that we all are, you know, pulling from so we can give our student athletes at Howard the best educational experience that they can have. That's a good segue, Duke guy. Uh, we got a couple more minutes here. Let's talk about Duke because uh, we've got a period, not a comma, coming in the timeline of, of, of college basketball. Coach K's last season, you were fortunate enough to win two national titles under Coach K. Uh, I, I want to I want to talk about him for the last couple minutes here and, and the lessons um, that you carry with you throughout your career from Coach K. And uh, could I get a Coach Kism out of you too, or what? No doubt. Well, I think, I think B, one of the things that was really neat is um, during the early part of COVID, my, my wife and I and my, my four-year-old daughter, she was three at the time, Naomi, we, um, we got out of D.C. and we were between D.C. and New York. My wife was living in New York at the time. I was living in D.C. And we were trying to find a place because we were so terrified of what COVID was not having a lot of information at the time. So we got on Airbnb, we ended up in Norfolk, Virginia. 
and we rented a house that was, you know, on the beach for a month, um, just so we could be able to get outside and have a little space and run around a little bit. My daughter, who has more energy than caffeine, um, you know, I it, it's hard to keep her bottled up in the house. So, um, you know, we were lucky and fortunate to find a great deal with this. And uh, one Saturday at nine o'clock on the dot, my phone rings and I look down and I'm like, oh, I got to take this call. <laughs> it's Coach K. And, I, I, you know, he go, Kenny, it's, it's Coach K. I'm like, I know who it is. I got to call our ID, man. <laughs> it's like, you're on speed dialing. <laughs> so, you know, he starts talking about Howard and how much he loves Howard and how much he loves this job for me. Most people may not know this. Coach K is probably one of the best marketing branding guys in the world, like hands down. It's not even close. It's not even close. Like Nike, uh, McDonald's, you know, your Fortune 500 companies can call this guy and he can put together you know, a package that just would blow people's minds away. So everything he looks at, everything he thinks about is all about branding and marketing. So when he's thinking about, you know, how he built Duke, he sees Howard in that same kind of lane because both academic schools, both enrollment is about 6,500 undergrad, another 3,500 or so with grad school. Um, both private, you know, not a traditional basketball power when he took over and Howard is not a traditional basketball power, you know, but can you utilize the academics? Can you utilize the alums? Can you utilize Washington, D.C.? Can you utilize the, the internships? You know, all of these different things he talked about and really building and developing Duke University's basketball program, uh, you know, for me to be able to do the same thing that he kind of has, has done it at, at, at Duke. So we spent maybe, you know, 45 minutes on the call that morning and I was just blown away because I didn't know that side of him. Um, I did know it, but not to the point where, you know, he starts really just digging in and, and you know, kind of layering the, the way that this thing should be built. Um, and it was all about branding and marketing. I'm bummed that we only have a half hour here, Kenny, because I want this conversation going three more hours. Um, but we're up on time. I think you won a lot of uh, fans over today from people watching it. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, anything else you wanted to add here before we wrap up? No, I think, you know, I'm so thrilled that I had this opportunity that Huddle has presented. Um, it's been an honor. I'm a big fan. Uh, you know, all of the different softwares and things that that huddle has has on the market for us as basketball coaches and for high school students and other people in the game uh it, it's just been awesome so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here uh you know doing this presentation for huddle thank you so much hey and thank you and froll's watching uh thank you for tuning in um we got a lot of excellent sessions the rest of the afternoon here uh but thanks for watching see you soon